Okay, so uh, good morning. I'm very glad to be here again today. Um, unfortunately, I can't be here live today. Um, I have some other commitment that I really can't reschedule. So in order to keep the continuity of the early morning show, I've pre-recorded this session and it'll drop onto YouTube at our normal time at 8.30 in the morning, Central European time on Thursday, 23rd of February. And today we're going to be continuing the topic of pitching. In fact, today we're looking at the topic pitching four, part four, the final part regarding the business development topic of pitching. And I was thinking, what would be the most interesting content to actually cover in the, this last session? If you remember, in the previous sessions, we had a general introduction to pitching about solicited and unsolicited pitching, and we looked at that in session one. Then in session two, we spent quite a bit of time looking at pricing, uh, because there's a ton of mistakes that lawyers and partners and legal practices make when it comes to pricing, especially when trying to participate in tenders or the dreaded RFPs. And then in the last session, we spent a bit of time looking at the spoken, not just the spoken, but also the, the body language and the visual and the non-verbal communicative aspects of pitching, such as that you might encounter if you have to do a beauty parade, which is when you have to present and pitch your practice or yourself to a potential client, which needless to say can actually be pretty daunting. So today I decided to look at perhaps one of the most controversial topics in legal business development, and in fact in sales at all, which is cold pitching and specifically from the phone. So as some of us might know, this is the topic which is called cold calls. Um, actually, I've written a book on this. Uh, it's one of my textbooks and it's called Warm and Cold Calls. So what's the difference between a warm call and a cold call? A warm call is when you're phoning to somebody that you know and you either try to get a meeting with them or you try to sell them something. Um, an example of a warm call in the legal industry might be uh, if you went to a networking event, you got someone's business card, you had a nice conversation, you might give them a phone call a few days later to suggest having lunch together. That's a warm call because they know who you are. In the legal industry, I don't think we have restrictions about doing warm calls uh, because you have a pre-existing relationship. They know you. On the other hand, in the legal industry and in many other industries, we do have restrictions on cold calls. A cold call is when you phone somebody to get a meeting or to sell them something, and you have no idea who they are, and they have no idea who you are either. <laughs> and uh, this, needless to say, is the most difficult thing that you can actually do in sales. Now, let me emphasize a very important point here. I am not saying that you should do cold calls. I'm not ad advising you to do cold calls at all. I know that in many countries you could get into some difficulty with the bar, theoretically, or maybe in reality, if you started doing this kind of direct selling. However, the reason I'm telling you about warm and cold calls is because it is the most challenging and the most difficult area of sales and of pitching, there's quite a few theoretical aspects that we can learn and take away from this even if we're not actually going to do cold calls themselves. You could apply them in warm calls, for example. Um, so don't, don't, don't think that I'm advising you to start doing cold calls. Um, I remember a few years ago when I was in Moscow, uh, I did cold call training for some lawyers, and it was very upsetting for quite a lot of them. We had some of the lawyers in tears, um, because when you do a cold call, there is a very high chance that you're going to annoy people and that they're not going to be very polite or friendly with you. And you can hear some colorful language, perhaps. Um, and most people who do cold calls, they do it badly. They do it very wrong because they have had probably no training in cold calls. Uh, they're selling some kind of rubbish, some kind of commodity product which they don't believe in. And they're trying to have success in this kind of mass pitching where perhaps 
a conversion of 1% might make the entire business operation profitable. So that's why you can go to some countries and you might find cold call centers. You would have dozens or hundreds of people in one big room and all of them are calling and calling and calling. It doesn't matter if 99% of them get a rejection, that 1% who don't get a rejection, it can make the entire venture actually profitable. Of course, it generally annoys 99% of the recipients of the calls. So very few people have a good opinion of cold calls. This isn't how you would do it or how you should do it in legal industry, especially for premium legal services. You cannot risk upsetting 99% of your client base because very quickly you would end up incurring some terrible um, reputational damage, uh, not to mention quite a few complaints. So. There are many ways that cold calls can be done badly, and I'm not suggesting you do it this way at all. The best cold call, when a person really knows what they're doing in pitching and in selling, cold calls can actually be one of the most effective ways to grow a practice, not just a legal practice, but any practice. I remember a few years ago, so a couple of years before I joined DLA Piper in St. Petersburg, I was actually in the legal recruitment and executive search industry. And one of our main ways of getting clients was to do cold calls. So I had my list. I had 10, uh, it was HR managers and HR directors. And I would call them and I would say, hey, you know, this is me. Uh, we're, we're, we're presenting these services. We can find you good quality employees. Uh, what do you think? Let's have a meeting. And they might have some objections and they might not be interested. Um, but with practice, it was possible to actually get some meetings. And a number of those meetings became mandates. And I remember now in 2023, I heard from some of my previous colleagues at that firm. It still exists in St. Petersburg. And they're still working all these years later. That's over 10, 15 years later with some of the clients that I managed to get. So... Cold calls can be incredibly effective um, because they cost basically nothing and they're quick. They're very, very quick. Um, maybe we're not comfortable with the idea of doing cold calls, then apply what I'm saying here when it comes to doing warm calls. And a strange thing that I've noticed, guys, and I'll, I'll share this secret with you, is that as lawyers, generally, we do have telephobia, especially the younger lawyers. And how do we prefer to communicate with our clients? Well, we love our email. Our email is nice and safe. That's our top priority for communication. After that, we might go to telephone call. Then we might go to video call. And then unfortunately, our last resort would be face-to-face -face meetings. Now, in terms of the conversion, which of these is most successful, it's the other way around. Face-to-face -face is more persuasive and will get you better results than a video call, than a telephone call, than your email. So if you don't use telephone at all, then you might. It could be an idea for you, at least with your current or your ex-clients. So today we're going to look at the concept of cold pitching, specifically by, by telephone, although a number of these ideas would actually work for cold emailing or warm emailing when you send a written pitch to somebody. So as normal, you can see on the screen, we have the 16 key concepts, which we're going to be looking at today. The first, oh, before, before we continue, let me throw an advert at you. Um, I have the Nicodonia concept cards. So we printed off these flashcards. Today we have 16 key concepts. Um, we, we sell these in a box. So if you're interested in buying the physical cards, the flashcards, costs 100 euros per box. There's 128 cards, which is the 16 key concepts for eight different topics. Actually, the first eight textbooks that I wrote in, in legal sales. Um, we, if, you, if you have this PowerPoint presentation, you can click on the little video advert, which we made before the pandemic. And we have information in Russian as well, because I made this when I was in, living in Russia. And also another thing to keep in mind is the 24 best pitch elements checklist. So I think I mentioned this before, a lot of the law firms, when it comes to pitching, you know, 
responding to an RFP or unsolicited proactive pitching, they're missing a lot of the best elements. We can't compete in terms of quality because your competitors have probably got good quality too. You can't compete in price because there's always someone cheaper. So how, how can you compete? So again, I put together a checklist of 12 sales elements to include and 12 practical elements. And if you're interested in this, drop me an email and we can we can discuss it. Because again, my provocative little statement is, I suspect that your pitches that you're sending to the clients or potential clients don't really differ that much from the other pitches. And therefore you're gonna be losing a lot of them when it comes down to price. Now, regarding pitching or actually regarding sales in general. I love this little concept. It's a quotation by Ovid. Let your hook be always cast in the pool where you least expect it will be fish. And what does this mean? It means you, you've got you to gotta do pitching. You've got to be proposing something. You've got to be proactive. You, you've got to send out messages to your current clients, your ex-clients, your potential clients, you have to be offering them something interesting. And if you do enough of this pitching and you have interesting value propositions and you're sending to the right people, the key decision makers, unsurprisingly, sometimes it's gonna, gonna work. It's gonna be lucky. You're gonna get some success. So I, I love proactive pitching. Uh, cold calls or cold emails, warm calls, whatever you want to do, it's nice because sometimes it will work. And when it works, then you repeat and you scale it up. And if it totally doesn't work, then you try something else. So you need to be resilient and you need to be you need to be pitching. Um, this is why I can't understand some lawyers who are living in a bubble. This is especially with younger lawyers. Lawyers living in a bubble who just do billable hours. They just do the work that's allocated or delegated to them by a partner um, or by a client. And they're good soldiers and they ask no questions and they just do the, the legal work and that's it. And I'm thinking, you're not worried about the pipeline. You're not concerned about where the work is gonna come from. What happens if it stops? You're gonna be out of a job. And also, do you like this kind of work that you're doing? Is this premium work? Is this helping you grow and develop? If it isn't, then you're you're kind of at a dead end there and you might want to do something about it to get the work that you want. You need to be doing pitching. So, you know, to some degree, and I hope I don't provoke the gods by saying this, you know, I don't mean to be hubristic, but to some degree, you create your own luck that if you're doing pitching, and you're putting some thought and preparation into it, it's not rocket science. Sometimes you're gonna be successful. Now, I was thinking also, another thing that I could share with you today is something which I discovered. Actually, I discovered this quite recently when I was working at Deloitte. So as you might know, 2020 to 2023, well, to the end of 2022, I was the business development manager for Deloitte Legal for Central and Eastern Europe. And part of my job was, unsurprisingly, business development and pitching. And what I discovered was two really useful instruments that I would recommend to you now. So just between you and me, and perhaps a few thousand other YouTube watchers, I really find it extremely useful to buy the license on Sales Navigator on LinkedIn. This is the most useful instrument that I've discovered at all for prospecting. So what this means is, of course, you have a LinkedIn profile, but if you pay the license, I think it's about 70 or 80 euros per month for one person, it changes all of LinkedIn into a searchable database. So you can limit your search by jurisdiction, you can look for people, or you can look for companies. And it's absolutely wonderful. So a lot of my work, uh, my target audience quite often is managing partners. So I can find the managing partners in whichever countries I'm going to be in. Um, on Monday, for example, I'm in Moldova. And so the day before yesterday, I found a couple dozen managing partners from rather nice law firms. I found them on LinkedIn uh, with Sales Navigator and I made a hit list. And then you need to reach out to them. To be honest, what I've discovered is you're going to have much more success if you don't only reach out to people in LinkedIn. I think in LinkedIn, um, this is my personal opinion. I think people perhaps don't read their messages that often or they get a lot of spam, but the response rate by writing in LinkedIn, I have discovered is no less than three to four times lower 
than if you send an email. So once I've connected to, let's say, managing partners, I drop them a message in LinkedIn. I say, hello, it's nice to meet you. This is me. This is what I do. I'm going to be in your country. Let's have a coffee. Let's have a meeting. Um, and I can do that because they have put themselves onto a business social media network. It means they are open for connection. And by them accepting my connection request, we now have an existing business relationship. And then once I've done that, in addition, I use something called hunter.io. So this is why the pictogram, the pic, no, where is it? This is why the pictogram has two different people there. The first one is a navigator, like on the C, that sales navigator license. You should buy it to find the names and the surnames of the people in the companies. And then the other license you should buy is hunter.io. Uh, that's the picture of the hunter. With this, you put in someone's first name and their second name and their website. And it's like a little spider. It's like a little trawler. It goes through the internet and it finds their, their emails, finds their email address. You could, of course, do this manually. You could put in someone's name into Google and try and find their email. It would just take a ton of time. So what I discovered is combining the sales navigator to make a hit list of target entities and people with hunter.io to get their contacts and then reach out to them and to pitch them um, a warm email with some value proposition, uh, I find that to be actually very successful uh, for, for pitching, for business development. And again, this isn't me. I don't resort. I don't do cold calls or warm calls. This is just email pitching. Um, I, I find this extremely useful. If you're interested in, I don't know, discussing this a little bit further, uh, I can, you know, drop me a message. We can, we can talk about it. I'm, I'm very much a fan of Sales Navigator. Now, we have seen before in pitching that there are different categories of people that you can pitch to. You can pitch to your current clients, your ex-clients, and your new clients. Uh, that's the one, two, four rule. Uh, we know that your easiest source of work is your current clients. So it'll take you one hour of effort to get work from current clients, two hours from ex-clients because they don't know you as well as your current clients, it's been a while, and then four hours to get work from totally new clients. However, it occurred to me, there's another type of prospect which doesn't conform to the one to four rule, and these are unconverted prospects. So this means somebody came to your law firm, maybe because your marketing was pretty good, you know, they, they saw your website, social media, your, your, your LinkedIn, Chambers, Legal 500, whatever. They came to your company and they spoke with you, but then like a dandelion seed on the, on the breeze, they drifted away and we lost them. So under the one two, four rule, these unconverted prospects wouldn't be visible because they are not current or ex or new clients. They're kind of maybe clients, cl potential clients, prospects who came but left. So a really nice target group for pitching, in addition to those first three, is the unconverted leads, which I call the um, unconverted prospects, which I call the dandelion seeds. So it would make sense that you as a lawyer or a partner, you should have four hit lists, at least four hit lists. You should have, I really do, do hope you have this, you should have a hit list of your current clients. You know, who are the people that you're actually working with just now? Um, that you're at least invoicing on a monthly basis. Uh, and the hit list, like all of them, is based on people, not entities. So these are the concrete people that you're that you're working with. Of course, you need to be connected to them in LinkedIn as well. Then your second list would be your ex-clients. Uh, you should have a list of all of your ex-clients because they're a very valuable resource that you can repitch and contact and come back to. And with your current clients and your ex-clients, it's totally acceptable to phone them. Uh, you will have a higher conversion by picking up the phone than you would by sending an email. And the other two would be your new clients. You might have an industry that you're going to focus on. So again, using Sales Navigator and Hunter.io, you might have a list of, let's say, 20 CFOs 
in the fintech sector, if you're a banking and finance lawyer, and these CFOs, you, you have the list of them, and then you run that through hunter.io and you get their email addresses. And that would be the hit list that you're going to try and approach. So you contact with them, you connect with them first on LinkedIn, you pitch them in LinkedIn, then you pitch them by email, perhaps with an IDA pitch, like we saw in sales writing, and you could follow up with a warm call. So that's that's totally fine. And then the, the other, the fourth, um, prospect list, the fourth hit list. Again, it's the dandelion seeds, your unconverted leads. I really hope that your company is recording people who came and had a meeting with you, a consultation, and then left and then didn't work with you. Because I suspect, based on my experience, in terms, in comparison to the one, two, four rule, these unconverted leads are probably a two. They are not as easy to convert as your current clients, but they are as easy to convert as X clients. Maybe you would pitch them a different value proposition. Maybe not the, the very same one that they had approached you about. And one thing that we do need to keep in mind when it comes to pitching, especially if it's something like warm and cold calls, is sales risk. I came to the conclusion, guys, that any proactive business development will carry some kind of risk. 99% of people are nice. But sooner or later, you will contact somebody, that 1% who's having a bad day. And in that case, they might not be very nice to you. You know, somebody might be rude. They might be abrupt. If you're doing something like warm and cold calls, you, you might hear exactly what they think. So I think I would suggest that you have to do worst case scenario planning. You make sure that you cover your back that you're not doing anything that in the worst case will get you into trouble, either with the bar in your jurisdiction or um, for, for solicitation at all. So whatever you're going to do, you make sure that you're GDPR compliant. Be careful about the data protection aspects. You would, you, you probably one of your friends does data protection, GDPR. So speak to them. Uh, be very aware of the reality of solicitation and the bar rules and see which 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 activities you definitely can't do in pitching. So maybe um, different marketing activities as well are, are not allowed. Um, so uh, in, in many countries, you're not allowed even to do advertising, let alone something like cold calls. So I think be prepared, you know, understand that there is a risk and that sooner or later you will meet that 1% of people who Hopefully they're just very, they're just slightly unpleasant and you can you can move on. Uh, but if someone starts to make a fuss, and I've heard about this, I was speaking to one of my colleagues in an Austrian firm, and that Austrian firm, that law firm, had made a mistake that they sent out a mailing, I think it was a newsletter, and they sent it to somebody who got onto that list somehow by mistake. And that person made a scandal about it and said, Hey, you know, you're you're processing my personal data. I don't like this. How can you do this? Fortunately, they managed somehow to resolve the issue, but you don't want to give yourself the stress or the anxiety of getting into these kind of situations. If you are destined to become a rainmaker, it means you will do a lot of proactive sales. So it means statistically, sooner rather than later, you're going to come across um, a challenging person. <laughs> Let's put it that way. So make sure that whatever you do, you're, you're aware of the sales risk. But the other side of the coin, and this is extremely controversial, is that there's a thing called the money irony. If you really had a super killer UVP that you were believing in and that you were very inspired by, you would be happy to be telling people about it. You wouldn't find it difficult to speak to strangers about this or even theoretically to do something like a cold call. And um, even if it was only a conversion of 2% or 5%, you would grow a practice and you would get some of these clients would then become relationship clients and you have the customer lifetime value. So a rather unsympathetic perspective when it comes to business development and sales is um, a reason. For, I think that one of the main reasons for a lack of success is people just don't do it. Lawyers don't attempt to do business development. They're not convinced. They have other priorities, which is probably billable hours. Um, and very few people reach that level where they 
I, I would call it the nirvana of sales. When you can say, I love cold calls, you have a strong value proposition and you're passionate and excited about it and you're happy to pitch it and you're not irritating people because you have good segmentation, you're approaching the right people, then you'll make a, a lot of money. You'll have a lot of success. Um, and until you reach that level, uh, you won't. <laughs> and I suspect most people will never reach this level because most people won't have that discipline or motivation or enthusiasm to really do this kind of proactive selling and deal with objections and deal with rejection. I think, actually, I don't think I know that when a lawyer makes their own practice and they see the numbers and they realize they have to pay rent and salaries and taxes and utilities, then that can be quite motivational <laughs> to do business development. And in that case, uh, you're more likely to kind of break through all of these psychological barriers and um, to to not fall foul of the money irony. Again, if you if you disagree with me, because what I'm basically saying is people are not successful because they don't want to be successful enough and they're not trying hard enough. So that's a bit of a pro provocative thing to say. If you if you disagree, you have some thoughts. You can you can drop me a message on this. But I think when you look at the extreme of cold call and cold pitching, there is some grain of truth in that, perhaps. And let's be honest: the real reason people are not doing warm and even especially cold calls or proactive business development is the fear. The fear. Lawyers are sensitive souls. They don't like rejection. They don't like objections. Um, and so it's much easier to stay in our comfort zone. Let's say you're a wonderful corporate lawyer. You can do your wonderful corporate work and you get praise and recognition for it. And it gives you that warm feeling inside. Um, you're going to want to continue doing these activities that are well paid and are recognized and rewarded. And then let's say you go and try something else like cold calls or cold pitching and people tell you to go to hell and they're rude to you and unpleasant and they hang up on you this isn't going to be very good for your ego and you're going to feel quite bruised and disenchanted with this and you'll probably quit you'll probably stop so so let's be honest with ourselves here one of the main difficulties in proactive pitching whether it's cold calls warm calls cold emails is fear uh, and people don't like to, to admit this. So how can you overcome the fear? Um, really understand the needs of your target audience. And if you understand the needs, then you can design a product UVP, a solution that they might actually be interested in and they might need. And you prepare for that. And then you make sure that you understand it and you believe in it. And then you pitch it and you suggest it. And then there's more success. There's more chance of success at least. Um, this is why most people hate cold calls, because they the, the people who are doing the cold calls have no real understanding of who they're calling. They don't care about the product they're offering, and they're just trying to get that 1% or that 2% conversion. So that's what we want to we want to avoid. It's okay to not like it when you get an objection. But another thing that we should understand as lawyers is if you're in a pitch meeting, and or you're doing a warm call and you get an objection it's an opportunity to understand what is the client afraid of and you can overcome the objections you know you can predict some of the objections and then preempt them so you might encounter the other lawyer objection the too expensive objection the lack of expertise objection and you prepare for them and that can also help to diminish your fear to have that kind of preparation for business development but now be careful, because at the heart of proactive pitching, by email or by cold call, would be the UVP. And we've seen this before, that a killer UVP is much more likely to get success. That means a strong, very strong value proposition. However, and I, I shamelessly quote myself here, if something sounds, if something seems too good to be true, it probably isn't. So you need to be careful that I've seen this happen in some countries that there are gray areas of law and we're lawyers and we're smart. And it is possible to come up with a value proposition or a solution and propose it to companies that is extremely valuable. Um, it just might not be totally legal. <laughs> it might not be totally 
okay to propose. So be careful that if you get too creative with a value proposition, you might be um, slipping into some rather suspicious areas of activity. Where is the gray line between tax evasion, tax minimization, tax optimization? You could get yourself into a lot of bother here. So I would say really do be very careful when you're creating a killer UVP. If it's too good to be true, uh, it might not be true at all. And then you, you should you should only do pitching with something that you're sure isn't going to come back and, and bite you in, in future. Um, and when you're doing your, your pitching and you're doing something like a cold call or a warm call, you just need to be very clear. What are you offering? Who are you offering it to? And why you're offering? Come down to the preparation. Um, and then if you're very clear about these, these questions, there's more chance that you're going to be concise and succinct. A nice point to share with you is that the ideal cold call, like when I was doing this in legal executive search and legal recruitment, the call itself would last maybe two to three minutes. The only purpose of that call was to get the person on the other line um, to agree to a meeting. And that was it. You don't need a sales script. You don't need to to talk about your company and the UVPs and the benefits and have a big half hour conversation. You might have a two or three minute cold call. It means you've got to be very concise. You've got to be very to the point. You don't want to waste people's time. So you should know what, who, or why. The preparation for your cold call or your warm call, that on the other hand might take much more time. That could take, oh, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes for a two or three minute call. So the preparation time is generally bigger than the, the pitch time itself. And if you're going to be doing um, something like a warm or cold call, and this also applies to beauty parades, when you do spoken pitching in front of an audience, when you present and you try to sell to them at the same time, don't speak too quickly. Don't get nervous, don't jabber. You can and you should use emphatic pauses. An emphatic pause is like a paragraph break in your conversation. It lets the other person digest what you've said and it adds emphasis. So emphatic pauses are good. I've seen this so many times when people do warm and cold calls that they start speaking too quickly, they get nervous, they get lost, they get confused, and then you just destroy your credibility and the other person will, will not really want to speak to you. Um, so emphatic pauses are good. You are cool, calm, and collected. Uh, so you, you you can do an emphatic pause in the in the in the call in the pitch itself, and the reason for you doing a pitch might well depend on a sparking event. If you simply pick up the phone and let's imagine you're doing warm calls to your ex clients because you want to re-stimulate relations with them, if you're just calling out of the blue randomly, it might be a little bit surprising or unusual for them. It's much better if you can find a sparking event. So in the example that I gave you before, if we have a hit list of the CFOs in the fintech sector, you might have the column with their names and surnames and websites, which you get from Sales Navigator. You might have another column where you have their email addresses that you then got from hunter.io. And then finally, you would have another column where you're looking at the reason, the sparking event, the legitimization for you reaching out to them. So this could be, in, in, for example, in Sales Navigator, you quite often can see if someone has changed position or got a new job. That's a, that's a reason to speak to them. You can look at their Twitter feed, their Instagram, their Facebook, their socials, their website to see that they opened a new facility, they started a new deal. You can look on the BBC, the CNN, the, the Guardian, different news sources. You can find sparking events. And when you when you connect a sparking event as a legitimization or a justification for you reaching out to them, it makes your pitch more more likely to succeed because it doesn't look like a mass spam or that you're doing this with many, many other prospects at the same time. It shows personalization and preparation and that you understand them and you're on their wavelength and you're more, therefore more, more likely to, to succeed in getting that meeting with them. And of course, perhaps I didn't mention this, but I should say in, in um, proactive pitching in warm and cold calls, uh, I would very 
much be surprised if you would do this in order to actually sell something. Probably the only objective of you doing something like a warm or a cold call would be to get a meeting because only at the meeting you have the consultation and then the meeting turns into a mandate. So it's quite unlikely you could do a warm call and pitch a legal product or solution and succeed with this, unless it was a raving fan. So we know that we have different levels of satisfaction of our clients. You have the majority, 90% are satisfied clients. And I wouldn't try and do a warm call to sell them anything. Um, you could do a warm call to get a meeting with them though. Then maybe 9% of your clients are raving fans. These are clients who absolutely love you. And in this case, you could pick up the phone and tell them what you think you guys should be doing next. And they could agree. You could theoretically sell on a raving fan current client by a warm call. And of course, that 1% are the wreckers. These are the clients who really don't like you. <laughs> Something went horribly wrong. Uh, in this case, I, I don't think they're going to risk. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try and do a warm call to them at all. I think you should probably leave them be. Um, so, yeah. That's, that's a sparking event. That's another column, another element that you can include into your, your proactive pitching. And of course, the best cold call never sounds like a cold call. If someone, if you pick up the phone and within a few seconds, you realize it's a cold call, you automatically have RRR, reactive rejection response. You want to get away. You don't want to be sold. And it doesn't matter what they're offering. This is a kind of defense mechanism. The best salesman never sounds like a salesman. The best cold call never sounds like a cold call. You have probably received cold calls. You didn't realize it was a cold call because you thought it was something else. You thought it was some business call or some ex-client or a friend of a friend. It was a cold call. You just didn't realize it was. So the best cold call never sounds like a cold call. Um, the best cold call is a warm call. Even if it was legal and ethical and legitimate to do cold calls in your jurisdiction, I think it'd be pretty silly to do that. The best cold call is a warm call. You should warm up your cold call. Definitely, for example, reach out to them, connect on LinkedIn, have some engagement, have a conversation there, exchange some emails, get their buy-in to give them a call, and then you and then you call them if you want to, if you want to really, you know, do this kind of thing. So don't do this is why I have the picture here, the little outline is Mickey Mouse. Don't do a Mickey Mouse call. A Mickey Mouse call is when a person does a very silly cold call which is obviously a cold call, and they're reading a script in a monotonous voice. Um, I, I have no idea how, why people would be doing that because it's really not going to succeed. So you'd need to warm up your, your calls before you just reach out to somebody um, randomly for sure. And be aware that if you're going to take this line of communication by pitching to somebody in such a way that they can have uh, objections, so we can think of the probability tree. What are the top objections we expect to hear from them? And you be prepared to answer those objections and to overcome them. However, sometimes what you get isn't objections, it's smoke screens. So people will start saying very silly things to you, such as, we have no budget for legal spend this quarter. Um, that's a smoke screen. They, they're not telling you the real reasons. It's just that they don't want to bother dealing with you. So if you identify a smoke screen, you need to dig deeper and to get through that smoke screen. And that excuse, we have no budget, is very, very silly. I bet that if they came to their office and they found that they were facing a massive litigation, they would find money. They would find budget to deal with the litigation, to hire some attorneys to defend their interests. What someone is saying when they say, we have no budget, is basically what you're offering isn't important enough for us. We have other things to do. That's that's all it's about. It's the same way that when someone says to you, I'm too busy, they're not too busy. It's just you're not a priority. So, you know, be prepared in terms of common objections and selling. This doesn't just apply to warm and cold calls. This applies to pitch meetings. Um, and be prepared about to, to deal with smoke screens, to get through the smoke screen, um, not to accept this obvious kind of bluff um, and to, to end there. And you do need to be calm, cool, and collected. The heart rate is extremely important. 
like in public speaking, like in beauty parades, like in spoken pitching, like in warm calls and cold calls, if you come across as nervous or anxious or stressed, if your heart rate goes up, you speak too quickly, you begin to sweat, you lose the sale. You need to be calm, cool, and collected. You are organized. You speak slower than normal even. You take emphatic pauses. You can have a glass of water. You can take a sip. You're prepared. You believe in your value proposition. You're ready to deal with objections. And nothing is going to phase you. Um, if you're doing a warm call or a cold call, you should be standing when you're speaking. And you should have one of those headsets so that you can gesticulate with your hands, so that you can walk around, so that you smile. You smile on the phone and the person, the person hears it. If you're stressed and anxious and nervous, this isn't going to work. This isn't going to work. And I think the last concept from today regarding warm and cold calls and this rather extreme form of pitching is nihidonia. You'll notice that the, the spelling of this in English is N-I-K-H-E-D-O-N-I-A. Uh, so this is coming from Greek. This is a word that we've, we've taken from Greek into English and it means the joy of anticipated success. So I changed the K-H into an X. I took that and I made it the name of uh, my company. This is what you need to aspire to. When you reach that stage of flow, that you understand what you're offering and that you're not a salesperson, you're a white knight, you're a savior. You have something very valuable and interesting to offer. You're doing these people a favor by reaching out to them and making them aware of it because this is valuable for them. When you have that kind of paradigm shift and you can reach the Zen of cold calls, which is to say, I love cold calls. I love beauty parades. I love real proactive selling. And you're ready to deal with whatever comes at you, objections and rejections. Um, then you're gonna have a ton of success. You're gonna be a real rainmaker. You're gonna have so much fun with this. Um, it is achievable. Again, I think most lawyers will not reach this level because they're comfortable where they are. They don't have this kind of hunger for success. They don't have this motivation aligned to reach that kind of extreme. But it is it is possible to to get there, um, and then and then you could become a real a real rainmaker. I think I have encountered some managing partners of law firms, and that's why they're managing partners <laughs> because they they've reached this kind of this kind of level of proactive selling. So I hope that was interesting for you. I had no idea if I've gone over time, probably. Um, you can see on the schedule, here are my upcoming visits in February. So on Friday, I'm going to be in Frankfurt. Next week, I'm in Moldova and Austria and um, Romania. And I have a few other, other destinations in March and April um, and May. Um, and I have a, a tour of the Mediterranean country. So if I'm going to be around in your country, if you're interested, reach out to me. Um, I have uh, not just actually about business development. So on the 22nd of February, uh, which is before this broadcast, I, I will do um, a legal writing session. And there is such huge interest. I had no idea that there would be so much interest. I wrote a book, another one. Uh, about the 36 rules of legal writing. So I think these are, maybe this is a synergy UVP. You know, I can I can help you with your business development as lawyers. And then I have some skills and experience with legal writing and, and drafting. So they, they actually come together nicely in sales writing as well. So if either of those are interesting for you, you can definitely contact me. Um, again, if you have the video, you click on these little hyperlinks, it'll show you some video adverts of some different topics that I do in training. And this rather groovy looking slide, it took me an age to make it. Um, if you click on these different icons, this connects to all of my so socials. So of course, you can see me on LinkedIn. Uh, I've started doing a Nicodonia Shorts campaign once a day. I publish a two or three minute video on a key concept. And I do this across social media. So we started on LinkedIn uh, two or three days ago. I created a WhatsApp account and a Twitter account. And so that's connected. So for, for WhatsApp, I think that's going to be for junior lawyers and paralegals, maybe. 
course, we have our YouTube channel with all of the, the lectures like this one and the Nikidonia shorts. There's the Instagram, um, Facebook, and, and of course, you can just email me. So feel free to contact me across any of the social media platforms. If you're interested in receiving the Nikidonia shorts to your email each morning, because I'm going to be continuing doing this day by day for a long time if you would like a daily video to your inbox drop me a message and i can i can set that system up so that'll give you one or two minutes of inspiration every day if if you won't get sick and tired of seeing me <laughs> all right i think on that point let's finish for today uh, this was a rather controversial topic i know a lot of people won't agree with some of the things that i've been saying and again let me just to add that caveat i'm not suggesting you actually do cold calls but i think it's very interesting from a sales perspective some of the the um angles that we can take to understand them and how that might apply in other areas such as warm calls beauty parades spoken pitches even networking okay thank you very much and i'll see you next time